Ready for a big day? Pop quiz? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, last time when I finished, I was just about to get into talking about digi digitoxygenin, or uh, digitoxin, which is what it's also called. Um, and I ran out of time, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about it, because it's a, an interesting um, uh, blocker of the sodium-potassium uh, channels. And, uh, I'm sorry, sodium-potassium um, uh, pump that I described last time. And uh, it's used medicinally, so uh, interesting uh, way that it works. To understand how digitoxygenin works, you need to understand another pump. So I'm going to tell you about another pump, and I don't have a figure, so you're going to have to sort of picture it in your head. All right? So the pump I want to tell you about is, this, is the sodium-calcium pump. Okay? Sodium-calcium pump. We find it in heart tissue. We find it in muscle tissue. And the sodium uh, potassium, um, um, sodium calcium, I can't even say it right, the sodium calcium pump works as follows. It uses the sodium gradient to drive calcium out of a cell. It uses the sodium gradient to drive calcium out of a cell. So it's an antiport, meaning that sodium flows in, and the flow in of sodium provides energy to drive calcium out. Okay? So it depends upon the sodium gradient, and the sodium gradient depends upon the sodium potassium ATPase that we talked about last time. So when the sodium potassium ATPase works, it kicks out sodium, the sodium gradient gets high, and the sodium wants to come flowing back into the cell, so as it comes flowing back into the cell, it kicks calcium out of the cell. Does that make sense? So sodium flowing in, calcium flowing out. Digitoxygenin blocks the pumping of sodium. So by blocking the pumping of sodium, what it's doing is it's lowering the sodium <laughs> gradient. It makes it less likely and less energetic for sodium to come in, which means that less calcium gets pumped out. Well, that turns out to be really critical for heart tissue because calcium causes muscular contraction. So by treating a patient with very low doses of digitoxin, what one does is one stimulates the heart muscle to contract more forcefully. This drug is used to treat congestive heart failure, where the heart is not pumping hard enough to provide all the needs for the body. Okay. So, yes, Shanice. So this is not a calcium channel blocker, no. This is a sodium potassium ATPase blocker. So calcium channel blockers do other things. Um, this is, it's a good question, but this is, is, is working solely by blocking the sodium potassium ATPase. Yes, sir. So his question really has to do with the mechanism by which the uh, ca calcium is pumped out. And to be honest with you, I don't know the mechanism, but one would expect it wouldn't be unexpected that you would have them sort of opposite uh, the, uh, the protein, but I, I don't know the mechanism. Sorry. Yes? So, no, no. So, it makes so, it more difficult for sodium to enter. So, what, 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 the, what the digitoxin does is it stops the pumping of sodium okay. out, which means there's less of a gradient, yes. which means there's less likely it, it will come back in. Yes. Right. And since it's coming in as necessary to pump calcium out, calcium out. concentration stays high in the heart cell, and the heart cell contracts more, more force, forcefully. Okay? So, it's kind of a cool mechanism. Very cool mechanism. So we see how these pumps can have very important implications medically. Before the lecture is over today, in fact, uh, the next thing I'll talk about is nerve transmission, which also uses these systems that we talked about. So we see that these gradients, these pumpings that cells are doing to maintain osmotic balance for one, also have uses in helping cells to do things. And so we'll, we'll see uh, that very well with nerve cells. Other questions about this one before I move on? Yes? Digitoxygenin is found in foxglove. That's where it's found. That's, that's, that's correct. 
Okay? Very good. Very good. Okay. Um, the, well, actually, there is one other thing I'll mention here, and that and not having to do with that, but another type of transporter. So last time I talked about um, transporters that used and had a phosphoaspartate, the sodium potassium ATPase was one, um, where a, an, a, a phosphate got attached to aspartic acid during the cycle of pumping. Okay? Those type of ATPases, I didn't give them a name, I'll give it to you here, they're called P-type ATPases. P-type ATPases always have, and this is a common feature that they have, is that they have an intermediate that has a covalent bond between phosphate and aspartic acid. So that's what P-type ATPases uh, do. A different type of ATPase is known as the ABC transporters. ABC transporters, you can see here, and they're just called that because they have a common set of domains, that is common set of structures, that are labeled ABC. Okay. Now, there are many ABC transporters, but one very interesting one is known as multidrug resistant protein. And multidrug resistant protein can actually be found in quite a wide variety of cells. One of the places um, where um, we can see this is in actually uh, our cells um, that happen when we're trying to treat for, for um, chemotherapy. And what we find with some types of chemotherapy is that the drug that we're using loses its effectiveness over time, and that effectiveness disappears because multidrug resistant protein is recognizing the drug that's coming in as foreign, and it kicks it out. Now, it's called multidrug resistant uh, protein because it works on a variety of drugs and kicks them out. Okay? So this is a factor when we think about disease resistance and things like that. Now, it's not, a speci it's not specific for any drug, and it can um, uh, work on a, quite a wide variety of structures. But it's an example of something that's an ABC uh, transporter. Yes? No. When I say kicks them out, I'm talking about kicks them out of the cell. So it's pumping them out of the cell. And that way it stops the drug from having its effect inside the cell, which in the case of a cancer cell might be to kill it. Okay, yes? So these are selected for these proteins? Well, certainly the fact that a cell could continue to grow would select for it. So yes, right. Okay, so let's talk about nerve transmission uh, a little bit. And nerve transmission is a pretty cool thing, okay? Pretty cool thing. It relies on the sodium-potassium gradients that we've been talking about. So nerve transmission is totally dependent upon sodium and potassium gradients. All right? How does it work? All right? Well, the sodium-potassium ATPase is doing its thing. And when it's doing its thing, and you're a nerve cell, or any cell basically, but a nerve cell in particular, what you have is outside the nerve cell, you have a high concentration of sodium because you've been kicking sodium out. And inside the nerve cell, you have a high concentration of potassium because you've been pumping potassium in. All right? So let's imagine I am out here and I burn my finger. I've started the stimulus for a nerve signal, something relating to pain in this case. There's obviously many other types of nerve signals, but in this case related to pain. Okay? That signal has to get started. All right? And the very first thing that starts the signal is that there are gates in these nerve cells that are specific for the ions sodium and potassium. One will let sodium ions in, one will let potassium ions in. Okay? How do they work? All right? Well, I'll, actually I'll talk about the mechanism by which they work in just a little bit, but I want to tell you what happens before I tell you how they do it. Okay? So what happens is the very first thing that happens in, in nerve transmission is the, um, the sodium gates open. That's the first thing that happens. If the sodium gates open, what's going to happen to sodium? It's going to come racing into the cell. All right? We go for something called depolarization. Depolarization means that we've changed the electrical 
potential across that membrane because now we've let a whole bunch of positive ions come flowing into the cell. And they flow in very rapidly. Remember that our nerve transmission has to happen very rapidly. I don't want to hold my finger in that fire for too long. I want to know pretty quickly, right? And our nerve cells are set up to do this. All right, so the sodium channel opens. Sodium comes racing in, all right? This phase that we call depolarization is happening right here. We're changing the potential. You can see this potential being voltage. We're changing the voltage because of the movement of these sodium ions. The nerve cell recognizes this and goes, oh, whoa, hold on. I've got to do something about this major influx of, of um, positively charged ions. And the sodium potassium ATPase doesn't work fast enough to, to change them. So what does it do? It opens its potassium gates. Now what happens is a whole bunch of positive ions are going to flow out, right? And the charge balance that we saw before starts to restore because potassium wants to go. Sodium is still just sitting there. But we're, now we're removing positively charged ions because potassium is flowing out. We're repolarizing the membrane. Okay? It turns out that the repolarization of the membrane actually does what we call overshoots. It goes past the place where it was because more potassium makes it out than really needs to. When that point happens, okay, we have a recovery phase at which the nerve cell doesn't do anything more, but the sodium and potassium uh, ATPase starts restoring the balance. It starts kicking sodium out and bringing potassium in. Okay? Now, how does this thing get transmitted all the way along a nerve cell? A nerve cell could be three feet long. Okay? How does that happen? Does that influx at one end flow all the way through that nerve cell very quickly? It turns out it does not. Okay? Instead, all along the nerve cell, there are more of these sodium and potassium gates all along the nerve cell. And guess what? Not only are they sensitive in the case of a, of a, of a pain receptor to touch, they're, res, they're, res, they're responsive to changes in voltage. Well, let's imagine that very first one that I had at the very end, everything opened up, I saw a change in voltage, and then I've got this recovery phase, right? Well, that recovery phase is happening because I've changed the ionic balance at that nerve tip. And that little tip where I change that balance, okay, some of those ions slip down to the next gate. That happens, the next gate is very close, it happens very rapidly, it goes to the next gate, and the next gate says, whoa, change in voltage, and the same thing happens. And it continues all the way along the nerve cell until it reaches a nerve cell junction. And I'll show you that in a second. So this process goes on and on and on and on and on, and it's happening so fast that you're not even really aware of it. You pull your finger out of the fire because, oh, it hurts. That process happened extraordinarily fast. So that's what's happening in the transmission of a signal across a nerve cell. We have to also see how that signal is transmitted between nerve cells. It starts at one end, and it goes all along this open, close, 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 open, close until it gets to the end. So what we see in the nerve cell, then, is literally a pulse of ions, a pulse of ions. Sodium going rrr high, and potassium going rrr low across that nerve cell. Okay? All right. This uh, shows schematically what I've told you happens. Okay? We have a stimulus. We see sodium flowing. All right? And then we see potassium flowing. In the meantime, we have the sodium potassium ATP is kicking in, which is ultimately what causes these guys to go back down. Okay. Um, tetrodotoxin is an interesting uh, toxin. It's found in a part of a Japanese delicacy known as the um, uh, pufferfish. People, anybody here ever eat pufferfish? 
It's a delicacy. And as long as you cut it up properly, you don't get the tetrodotoxin. But if you do not cut it up properly, you get some of the tetrodotoxin in there, and it's fatal. Okay? So it's interesting that, that a delicacy can actually kill you if it's not, um, if it's not cut up properly. But uh, the reason it's, it's fatal is because tetrodotoxin is a sodium channel inhibitor. All right? So it blocks the sodium channels and prevents the movement of sodium um, um, into cells. All right. Well, I said I would tell you a little bit. Let's see. Uh, before I do that, hold on. I want to tell you how it moves between cells. Then I'll come back and talk about that. So I've talked about how the, chi the signal moves from one end of a nerve cell to the other, but nerve cells have to communicate with each other to make sure that that signal makes it to the brain. Okay? Or the spinal cord is appropriate. All right? So how does this signal move between cells? Well, if we look at the top nerve cell there, that wave that I described has been coming downwards. It's been coming. Yeah, question. Yes. Yes. What happens if we inhibit the sodium potassium pump? OK. OK. Well, I described one place where we do that. Digitoxin, for example, does block that. So in, it, it, digitoxin is poisonous. It will kill you. Um, in very tiny doses, as I said, it is um, uh, beneficial for heart. But if we block, if, if, if we block our sodium potassium channels, we are dead. Yeah. So, yeah. OK. Now, this nerve cell uh, has a wave of sodium that's been coming down it. All right? All right? And this wave that comes down causes uh, the cell to, uh, um, causes the nerve cell to respond to it. Okay, so let's see. What do I want to say here? Um, we have okay. This uh, we'll just assume for the moment that we're talking about sodium. And this this by the way doesn't have to be sodium moving across here. But for the moment, we'll just say it's sodium. Okay, these are what we call neurotransmitters. All right, and the neurotransmitters are transmitting the signal from this cell over to this cell. For the simplest purposes, we'll say this is sodium. Okay, and it can be sodium. All right, so. As the signal is coming down, we have near the end of the cell, we have things called synaptic vesicles. And these synaptic vesicles have within them a molecule that can interact with the, uh, the um, next nerve cell. Okay? This, these synaptic vesicles, as they come down, I'm sorry, as the signal comes down, the synaptic vesicles will fuse with the end of the nerve cell. And when they fuse with the end of the nerve cell, what they do is they get released into the, the um, I'm sorry, into the gap between the individual nerve cells. The gap is known as the synaptic cleft. Okay? These neurotransmitters that are right here will stimulate the opening of the sodium gates in the next one. Okay? So when they stimulate the opening of the sodium gates, now this nerve cell does exactly what this nerve cell did, and the signal gets propagated. All right? So I wasn't very coherent on that. Let me start that over. All right. Signal comes down. Sodium comes down, causes the synaptic vesicles to fuse with the synaptic, to fuse with the end of the membrane, and the, the neurotransmitter in the synaptic vesicles is released into the cleft. It binds to the next nerve cell and causes the sodium gates to open and exactly the same thing to happen that happened before. Okay. Yes. Right. So your question is, what's the relationship between this and the sodium that's coming down? Okay. I said this could, we could imagine the sodium, and the reason I said we could imagine the sodium is sodium causes a voltage change, which would cause this to happen. This doesn't have to be sodium. In fact, it's usually not sodium. What we would have here is something that is uh, a neurotransmitter, so acetylcholine or something like that, that has receptors on the next nerve, uh, on the next cell. The relationship of sodium is simply that the sodium causes the fusing of the synaptic vesicles with the end of the membrane. That's, that's what the relationship is to the sodium. OK? Yes? How does the binding occur? OK. You're talking about the binding onto this one or the binding of the synaptic vesicles? The binding of 
Okay, so the interaction, the two nerve cells themselves don't, don't fuse. Okay, so what's happening is this nerve cell is releasing neurotransmitters into this gap. And it's the neurotransmitter that's binding to a receptor that's now causing the sodium gates to open. Okay, does that make sense? I, I wasn't very clear in how I said that. Everybody got it? Clear as mud? Okay. All right. Um, let us talk about the sodium and potassium channels, and then we'll finish this uh, transport uh, business up. Now, how is it that these proteins that allow sodium and potassium to move among them, how do they work? We might say, well, they're just specific for them. Well, it's more complicated than that. Why? Well, because potassium is bigger than sodium. Potassium is bigger than sodium. That means that the potassium gate has got to be bigger than the sodium gate does. Well, if it's bigger, how in the world does the potassium gate keep sodium out of it? Right? We've got a bigger hole, but basically only potassium or preferentially potassium flows through it. There's not much sodium that flows through that gate. How does it accomplish that? Now, this is a, a bit of a, of a complicated concept, I will tell you. All right? It's a bit of a complicated concept. So bear with me. Okay? Let's think about the sodium gate first. It's the easy one. Okay? The sodium gate works in a very simple uh, fashion. Okay? Potassium doesn't fit into it. It's too big. The sodium gate is set up very nicely so that it accommodates the exact size of a sodium um, uh, atom, ion. All right? But it won't allow potassium, which is bigger, in. When we think about the potassium gate, we have a different consideration. Okay? It turns out that the way that the exclusion is done is rooted in energy. And it's going to be confusing for you, so I'll, I'll warn you that to begin with. It's rooted in energy. There are energy differences by which a potassium ion makes its way through the gate compared to a sodium ion. All right? How does a potassium ion make it through? Well, the potassium ion is the right size, but more importantly, it is the right dimensions for the gate. When an ion goes through this gate, it has to do something called desolvate, excuse me, desolvation and then resolvation. It has to be able, so desolvation meaning that an ion is surrounded by water molecules. Because remember, water has partial negative charges on the oxygens. And potassium has a positive charge. In order for this ion to make it through, it has to shed those waters so it can make it through the gate. Otherwise, it's too big. That's desolvation, shedding those waters. Okay? It takes energy to shed waters. It takes energy for sodium. It takes energy for potassium. If the movement of the ion through generates more energy than it takes to shed the waters, then that movement will be favorable. Okay? And if that shedding of the waters is a greater amount of energy than is realized going through, then it won't be favorable. All right, so that's the basic starting point. All right? If the desolvation takes less energy than the energy gained by moving through the channel, then the movement will be favorable. If it takes more energy, then the movement will be non-favorable. All right. Well, it turns out that the way that the potassium channel is set up is it makes that movement through much more favorable energy-wise as it's passing through. How does that happen? Well, it turns out that the nice dimensions of the potassium ion fit very nicely in that little chamber as it's wiggling its way through. Okay? 
As it's wiggling its way through, it's perfectly shaped for a potassium. It's not perfectly shaped for a sodium. A, a sodium bounces around in there because it's too small. It doesn't have the right dimensions to interact with all the stuff that a, the potassium ion gets to interact with as it's going through. Therefore, those favorable interactions that a potassium ion has actually helps it to get more energy as it's passing through. Sodium doesn't get that benefit. And so sodium gets blocked because it's not energetically favorable. This figure actually shows this. Here's the desolvation energy. This is the energy it takes to start the process. This is for a potassium. Here's the energy realized as a result of moving through with those favorable interactions. There's more energy released than it takes to get in. This process on the left is favorable. Sodium, here's the, here's the desolvation energy. It actually takes a little bit more desolvation energy again because sodium is, has a different uh, dimension. There's the desolvation energy, and here's the resolvation energy it gets on going through. It's energetically unfavorable. So even though the potassium channel has a bigger hole, all right, the sodium ions, for the most part, do not pass through. It's not absolute. Do some make it through? Yes. Okay. So it's not an absolute thing. But preferentially, potassium makes it through much more preferentially than does the sodium. Yes? That's true for any other ions smaller as well. So if you tried to do this with lithium, you would have a similar problem. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. The person that discovered this won the Nobel Prize. In fact, he spoke at Oregon State a few years ago. And for all of you pre-meds, he was a very interesting uh, character. Okay? He went to medical school. He got a four-year degree in medical school. And he got out and he started practicing as a physician. And he told his wife, I don't want to do this anymore. And he told this story really great. He, I don't want to do this anymore. And he said, any sane woman would have said at that moment, I'm out of here. <laughs> you know? But she said, OK, honey, what do you want to do? And he said, I think I'd like to do research. This is a true story. Right? I think I'd like to do research. And she said, OK, why don't you go get a PhD and do research? After all the years of medical school, after all the money of medical school, after all the various things, she said, why don't you go do that? And so he went and he did that. And he obviously knew what he was doing. He went and he won the Nobel Prize. Pretty cool thing. OK. Yes? Is this a different concept than gates? These are gates. These are gates. What we're talking about here are sodium and potassium gates. Absolutely. Yeah, the question is there's no real closing and opening uh, here. There actually is some flexing. All these, remember, these are not solid structures. So there is flexing that's happening here. So I would not agree with that, no. Yes? OK, so his question is, is, the, is the, the difference in the sodium gate a, a size thing, or is it an energy thing? It's primarily a size thing, because the potassium is just too big. Yep. So what really happens in the channel that makes this energetically more favorable, right? So there's a set of, we can see interactions uh, here that are happening inside of that channel. And we can see that they're very, very nicely set up so that we think about these interactions of partial charges and so forth. They don't happen over very long distances. If we make them too long of a distance away, they will not happen. Hydrogen bonds, for example, don't happen at a very long distance. They happen over very short distances. These distances to this guy are optimized. They work very well. These distances to this guy are a little bit longer, and they're not optimized. And consequently, they're not able to help the ion move through. Okay? So this is what's actually driving this, is the dimensions of these two nuclei. And that very tiny dif distance of difference, uh, the difference of distance between the size of this guy and the size of this guy changes the nature of the interactions significantly. It's, it's releasing energy. 
Well, I wouldn't say it's releasing energy, but in a sense it is, in that this is energetically favorable as a result of the way that it's happening. So yes. How do they help the potassium to move through the channel? Well, again, we can imagine that, we, let's, let's say that I've got an interaction of, maybe I've got 50 of these things. When it first comes up, it encounters this pull, all right, because here's some negatives, here's some positives. It gets in a way as we see a slight shape change. Slight shape change happens, and then the ones that were pulling at the front are further away, and now it gets pulled in, and it gets pulled in. And so the dimension, that's why it's saying this is not a fixed, solid structure. We're seeing flexibility that's happening here, and this is helping to get it in because as this protein adjusts on, with, with the movement of this thing through it, then a new set of minus charges become favorably there for it. Does that make sense? Yes. Right. So her question basically is, what happens? It gets desolvated by water. Does it get resolvated? I think is your question. And the answer is yes, it does. Because any ion in water is going to be surrounded by water. This is in the absence of, this is in a, you know, a, a, a chamber that doesn't have water in it. So that's why it's, and, and the dimensions of this chamber are such that we have to get the water stripped off. Here's, Here's what that would look like, okay, over here, if we had all those waters on there. It wouldn't fit in the, in the chamber. So those waters have got to come off, and they come off at the price of energy. Okay. That's a difficult concept. Yes? I'm not sure I understand what your question is. Yes? So there, the, you get the contribution of the energy from the addition of water. That's the resolvation part. But you're also getting the energy from the movement of something from a high concentration to a low concentration. So the sum of those is greater. That's why this, is a, this, this process is, is uh, driven by diffusion, because we have to have a high concentration out and a low concentration in. So it's the sum of those two that makes the resolvation process more energetically favorable. That's why. OK? Yes? Yeah, as far as I know, I think I said that earlier. I, I, I lithium ion, as far as I know, will be similarly excluded. excluded. Yes. Oh, you said from the sodium channel. Yes. And in fact, I, I believe that that's correct also. Yes. Yes. A lot of questions. Boy, this is good. Does calcium bind preferentially to the channel molecules over water? Does calcium, does potassium bind preferentially to the uh, channel, channel interactions or the channel atoms here over water? Um, it definitely will because potassium is positively charged and water is at most going to be partially positively charged on the hydrogens and it's going to have completely the wrong dimensions. So yes, there's a very diff definite difference between those. Is that the desolvation is a, is, a, is, a is a fairly complicated uh, process, but it's facilitated by the entry of the potassium into the chamber. So there's a, there's a stepwise process that's going to take to remove those, those water molecules. Yes, sure. Yes? Do we know of anything that can opportunistically use this channel? Some, some toxin or something the cell would want? In Do we know anything that can opportunistically use this channel like a toxin that the cell wouldn't want in there? Basically, no. We're talking about pretty small dimensions here. So a toxin would be molecular in nature. It would be bigger than a single atom. Um, could uh, arsenic or something like this fit into here? Um, I would say that cells probably have... Uh, figured out ways of excluding that fairly well. So I, I, don't, I don't know of anything that would opportunistically do this, no. Okay. Well, let's turn our attention to um, some very important things relating to um, uh, uh, membranes and transport. Okay? This has to do with mitochondria and energy. Okay? So I've been talking for the past over a term now about the fact that mitochondria are the power, power plants of the cell.
Now we're going to learn how they work, and we're going to look at them up close and personal. Mitochondria have two very important processes that happen in them, as well as a whole bunch of metabolic reactions that happen in them. We're going to focus on the processes here. The processes that happen inside the mitochondria that will be of concern to us are electron transport, that's the first one, and the second one is oxidative phosphorylation. They are separate processes but they are also interdependent processes. Electron transport is required for oxidative phosphorylation. And as we shall see, oxidative phosphorylation is also important for electron transport. So they're interdependent. We'll see how that happens. I showed you earlier the structure of a mitochondria, and you've seen this before, and I pointed out that these infoldings of the inner membrane, called cristae, are really important in the function of the mitochondrion. It's in these cristae and along the inner membrane of the mitochondrion where all of the action of the mitochondrion occurs. This is where the electron transport occurs. This is also where oxidative phosphorylation occurs. The reactions that I talk about happen inside here, where the, literally the cytoplasm of the mitochondrion is. All the reactions are happening in these open spaces inside of here. This includes the citric acid cycle that we've already talked about. It also includes fatty acid oxidation that we'll, we'll soon be talking about. Okay. There's a schematic showing you up close and personal. There's the outer membrane that I said isn't very important. The inner membrane that's very important. And the matrix, which is where all these reactions are occurring. Okay? I'm sorry, the metabolic reactions are occurring. The processes are occurring inside of the uh, inner membrane, of course. Okay. Um, this schematic shows, in very simple terms, electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation. Very simple terms. Okay? Electrons go, excuse me, electrons go in. The entry of electrons into some complexes that we'll talk about of the inner mitochondrial membrane. The entry of electrons causes protons to be pumped out. So here's a pump, again, that's very important. We're, caught, we're creating a proton gradient. We've seen gradients are useful for doing things. And the electrons ultimately get added to water, I'm sorry, get added to oxygen to make water. This is why we need oxygen in order to make NAD. Because NADH is, the, is one of the sources of electrons. NADH comes in here. If we don't have oxygen, there's no place to put those electrons, and the process stops. If there is oxygen, then NADH becomes NAD and goes on and now ca uh, is able to accept more electrons from oxidative uh, processes. All right, on the other side, we have the process of oxidative phosphorylation. And oxidative phosphorylation uses that proton gradient. Here's those protons that we pumped out. The protons come flowing back in. And as we shall see, amazingly, there's a little turbine that's there. And it literally is a turbine that spins. And the spinning of the turbine, as we will see, is what creates the ATP. Really remarkable process. This is a molecular motor. A molecular motor. No question about it. OK. Well, that's the process in simple terms. Um, oh, this actually reminds us of something that's kind of cool. Mitochondria have their own DNA. They're the only organelle in our body that has their own DNA, but they do have their own DNA. We think mitochondria were captured cells originally during the early evolution of life. Bacteria don't have mitochondria, but the cells that captured, those mi that, that captured the cells that, were mi that became mitochondria had an advantage, probably, and that advantage led to what we became uh, today. The DNAs that we see inside of the um, um, mitochondria are more closely related to bacteria than they are to humans, okay? meaning that the original cell that got taken up probably was like a bacterium of some sort. Okay. Now, the DNAs 
that are found in mitochondria vary enormously from one organism to another. Here's ours. Here's a plasmodiums. Here's a rhabdopsis. Here's a rickettsia. Okay, and it says, uh, 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 I'm sorry. This this is the rickettsia genome itself. So this is the back. I got back up on this. Mitochondrial, mitochondrial, mitochondrial. That is a bacterial genome. So you can see that relative to a bacterial genome, the mitochondrial genome is smaller. But even there, there's a fair fluctuation in size of mitochondrial genomes between different organisms. OK. Now, um, redox potentials. Okay. I don't spend much time talking about redox potentials. But suffice it to say that redox potentials are important to consider because they describe the movement of electrons. Electrons will tend to move in the direction of the most positive redox potential molecule. Notice that at the very bottom of this list, oxygen, this reaction with oxygen, has the most positive redox potential, meaning that electrons really, really, really like to get to oxygen. Okay. The sources of electrons are up here. Okay? Here's NADH, NADPH. We can see that they can flow from here down in, in this direction. That's exactly what's happening with these molecules, or with these, I, with these electrons, I should say. All right. Well, let's look at the process. The process of electron transport is pretty cool. Again, we're talking little proteins that are in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So here's the inner mitochondrial membrane. And one of the really, really critical features of the inner mitochondrial membrane is that it is impermeable to protons. It's impermeable to protons. Peter Mitchell, back in the early 1960s, proposed what we now know of electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation and how they worked. And when he proposed it, they said he was nuts. You can't make ATP this way. A battery in the cell? Are you crazy? There's no way, because this is functioning just like a battery. Well, it turned out he was exactly right. One of his hypotheses about the way this worked is it was that it required an intact my inner mitochondrial membrane. That's really important, because if I poke a hole in the inner mitochondrial membrane, the protons that I'm kicking out will leak back in, and I don't have a gradient. Okay? So one of his hypotheses was that, and he was exactly right and it turns out very critical. We'll see more about that in just a bit. How does this, this system work? Well, NADH comes from reactions in a variety of places in the cell, but in the matrix, they comes from the citric acid cycle. We have NADH, and we have FADH2. When NADH encounters this thing up here called complex 1, and that's what that Roman numeral 1 is there, it donates electrons and releases uh, a proton, and the electrons enter complex one. This is an electrical circuit. This is the other thing people thought was nutty. Are you crazy, man? By the way, Peter, Peter Mitchell won the Nobel Prize after um, everybody realized that he was exactly right. All right. Electrons enter complex one, and they travel through complex one, and complex one is multiple proteins. Wherever it has the word complex up here, there are multiple proteins involved. The movement of electrons through complex one causes complex one to pump protons out of the matrix and into what's called the intermembrane space. That is the space between the inner membrane and the outer membrane. This causes a proton gradient. FADH2 does not enter at complex 1. It enters at something called complex 2. And complex 2, same thing happens. Electrons come in here. But you'll notice no pumping of protons in complex 2. No pumping of protons in complex 2. This tells us that if electrons come from FADH2, they're not going to charge the battery as much as electrons coming from complex one, because that's what we're doing. We're charging a battery. By increasing the number of protons, we're increasing the voltage potential across 
the membrane there. Well, both complex one and complex two donate their electrons to something called coenzyme Q. This looks like one is going through two, but it's not. It's going from one to coenzyme Q, or it's going from two to coenzyme two. Remember, this is three dimensions, so it's kind of hard to depict this in two dimensions. So the electrons from complex one go to coenzyme Q. The electrons from FADA, from, from complex two go to, complex, uh, to coenzyme Q. And at this point, they're traveling in pairs. They came in in pairs. There was a pair from NADH. There was a pair from FADH2. But coenzyme Q has the property of acting like what I call a traffic cop. It accepts electrons in pairs, but it passes them off individually. And that's important because complex three can only handle them individually. And complex four can only handle them individually. So this traffic cop function that coenzyme Q performs is important. And coenzyme Q is a small molecule. Complex one is big, complex two is big. Coenzyme Q is a small molecule. It's able to move back and forth and back and forth and back and forth very quickly between these complexes and complex three, which is also a big honking thing. Coenzyme Q doesn't pump any protons, but it passes electrons onto complex three, which does pump protons. And when it pumps protons, the gradient increases. Coenzyme Q, I'm, I'm sorry, um, complex three passes electrons, and it's not even shown on here, to something called cytochrome C. Cytochrome C. Cytochrome C is a tiny protein that is also able to move very fast. So the complexes have these little shuttles that carry things between the bigger complexes. Cytochrome C takes those electrons from complex three and passes them on to complex four. And complex four pumps out protons as electrons pass through it. And as they pass through complex four, they finally end up added to oxygen to make water. As I said, if we don't have oxygen, we're in trouble. Because when we don't have oxygen, electrons can't go from complex four to here, which means that electrons can't go from cytochrome C to here, which means that electrons can't go from complex three to cytochrome C, and you start seeing everything starting to back up. When they back up to here, and this happens very quickly, when they back up to here, NADH cannot dump off its electrons, meaning it stays as NADH. And that's why when we had no oxygen, we couldn't make NAD. Okay, We couldn't make NAD, and that's going to be a real problem for us if we're needing energy quickly. Yes? So the protons from NADH, are they actually used in complex one, or are they... Okay. So, yes, good, good question. It's a common question. What happens to the protons here? The protons are just released into the solution. So there's not a direct tie between the protons there. We've got time for a quick song. Let's do it. From the fatty acids in our cells to the lipids in our brains, we are made of biochemicals built in metabolic chains. Using glycolytic ATP and electron energy, we can synthesize most everything with the help of delta G. A cell will tend to pump out sodium, but potassium it imports. It accomplishes this magic with ATPase antiports. Our bilayer lipid membranes protect the cell's insides. Partly made of sphingolipids, we know as gangliosides. When it comes to regulation, the little cell has got it made. It phosphorylates a lot of things with its own kinase cascade. Stimulated at a hormone site, metabolic yang and yin. That's turned on by epinephrine and turned off by insulin. All right. Can I ask a question? Sure. 